a severe weather update from the First Coast's most accurate weather team, certified by Weather Rate. Good evening, folks. Maybe you're taking a break from that Jags game, or maybe you're just sitting at home keeping an eye on the tropics, monitoring what we could be seeing here later this week. I'm meteorologist Ross Mumo with First Coast News, and here to just kind of give you an update on what will soon be tropical storm, if not Hurricane Helene, but for the time being, right now is potential tropical cyclone number nine. So this is the area of really just cluster of thunderstorms that we are watching down in the western and northwestern Caribbean, really just to the west of Jamaica. But uh, we are expecting this thing to intensify here over about the next 12 to if not 24 hours by um, potentially 11 p.m. tonight, but definitely by either 2 a.m. or 5 a.m. when you first wake up tomorrow morning, uh, this will become Tropical Storm Helene, and it really will just kind of meander around a little bit until it gets past the Yucatan and western Cuba, uh, really by about Wednesday afternoon. Once it finally moves up into the Gulf of Mexico and takes that right-hand turn, that's when it's not only going to further strengthen, but also really just kind of make a beeline towards Florida's Gulf Coast and really more so to narrow it down for you towards Florida's Big Bend. So generally between Apalachicola and Cedar Key there in the Big Bend area, that is where we are anticipating landfall potentially as a major hurricane right now forecasted to intensify and strengthen into at least a category three storm with 150 mile per hour sustained winds before moving on shore late Thursday afternoon if not into the evening hours, but this is going to be a very fast moving storm, which is good news for a, a lot of folks. It's not going to train over one location for a long period of time like we saw with Debbie, which brought us all those flooding concerns. Once it does start to move northward, it's pretty much going to book it straight up through southern, central, northern Georgia, and then eventually up into the Appalachian Mountains there in northern uh, or in western North Carolina and eastern Tennessee. So uh, here's just another way to look at it. Spaghetti models also again, pretty much zoning in on that area between Apalachicola and Cedar Key in that big bend area of Florida for this storm to make landfall again Thursday afternoon and evening. So we do have tropical storm warnings in effect for portions of Cuba and the Yucatan Peninsula and then also a tropical storm watch for Key West and really the furthest western Florida Keys there uh, for the next couple of days. Here is just kind of showing where the wind radii could potentially be. So you can see anywhere from Tampa to Orlando, even Fort Myers, and then the whole way up towards the first coast. Nearly all of us are going to be experiencing at least tropical storm force winds. Now, the damaging wind gusts are going to skirt right along Tampa's coast, but that will then eventually move up towards Tallahassee, the Big Bend area. And for areas or for folks in our area, really right along that I-75 corridor, so Lake City, northward up to Waycross could potentially see wind gusts 60 to 70, if not at least 80 miles per hour. And we'll get a little bit more into that here in just a little bit. So this is the track on top of one of our uh, weather models to just kind of depict what's going on here. So as I had mentioned, by Tuesday afternoon, it starts to strengthen into that category one storm as it clears the Yucatan and Cuba and begins to move up into the Gulf of Mexico. We have very, very warm water still in abundance there in the Gulf of Mexico. You combine that with very conducive upper air environments, uh, which is really going to allow this thing to rapidly intensify. The best news is that again, it's going to be moving very, very quickly. So the less time over the open, warm ocean waters, the better for a lot of folks. So yes, it is going to continue to strengthen, but if this was a slow mover, man, we could be talking about a cat four, cat five, which we still potentially could, but the fact that it is moving a little bit quicker means that it's not going to have nearly as much time to strengthen over the next couple of days. Rain wise, though, we're still going to see a lot of outer bands begin to move towards the first coast long before the storm ever makes landfall. So Tuesday, you're going to be fine. Lots of sunny skies for you tomorrow. Wednesday, though, we're going to start to see a little bit of an increase in cloud cover as you head throughout the day, primarily higher clouds, and that's going to be those overreaching clouds from what will be Hurricane Helene. Now, late Wednesday evening, we might start to see the first of a few uh, showers begin to stream in on shore here, but really it's going to be early Thursday morning. You start to see these embedded thunderstorms begin to push on shore, some of which could bring an isolated tornado risk, which will really be the main concern for folks early Thursday morning. Then by late Thursday afternoon, continuing into the evening hours, that's when the worst of the rainfall and really just the storm in general begins to not only impact for the first coast, but also the Big Bend area, Tallahassee, a lot, a lot of heavy rain and potentially very, very strong winds. Now, how much rain could we see? I know that's going to be a big deal for a lot of folks, right? 
We've picked up so much rain through the first half of September. Um, I think Jacksonville's picked up over a foot of rain already. That's about seven inches above average uh, to date so far in the month. For most of the coastal areas, we're going to be talking about two to four inches. Now, the further west you go out towards Lake City, out towards where this will likely make landfall, much more likely to see four to nearly six, seven inches of rain with locally higher amounts possible where uh, some of those embedded thunderstorms will be. Now, let's talk about the wind here. With Debbie, we really didn't see all that much wind. It was yeah, a little breezy, a little gusty here or there, but they did not close the bridges and really it was just a, a, you know, a flooding and rainfall event. This time we're certainly going to feel the impacts of the winds. By Wednesday, wind gusts anywhere from 20 to 25. By Thursday afternoon, you can certainly see them starting to pick up. We're looking 30 to 40 mile per hour wind gusts and they just continue to increase as you head from Thursday afternoon into Thursday evening. A lot of folks anywhere from 50, if not to 60 mile per hour wind gusts across the majority of the first close or the first coast, excuse me, where the eye moves on shore right near that eye wall. That's where we're going to see those 70 to 80, if not 90 to 100 mile per hour wind gusts moving on shore there. So winds certainly going to be much more of a concern this time around than they were last time with Debbie. But now let's just kind of break it down for you county by county, uh, specifically for Thursday. We've already issued a weather impact alert for the entire day on Thursday, but the worst of it for folks in Jacksonville and Duval County are really going to be between about noon and midnight Thursday night into Friday morning. As I just mentioned, yes, we're going to see rain, but wind gusts 50, maybe 60 miles per hour and that isolated tornado risk will still be a concern throughout the daytime hours and into your Thursday evening. Now, where the worst of it is likely going to be Baker Union, Bradford, Columbia counties out towards the Suwannee Valley. The worst is really going to be pretty much from uh, the time the storm makes landfall, which could be shortly after two o'clock, really three, four p.m. and then through the remainder of the evening. This is where you're going to see your strongest wind gusts, 80 plus mile per hour wind gusts. Uh, we're saying at least 80 again could potentially be closer to 100, if not even exceeding that. So this forecast will be fluid. It'll change here a little bit over the next couple of days. So we'll be able to um, fine tune it a little bit. But for the time being, we're saying 80 plus flying debris could certainly be lethal there as well. And some tornadoes will still be possible. But uh, expect power outages. If you live out in Columbia County, Bradford, Union, Baker, even really Western Baker, certainly could see some power outages. A lot of downed trees will certainly be a possibility as well. Now let's head up into southeast Georgia where Charlton, Brantley, Pierce counties. The worst of your impacts going to be from 8 p.m. Thursday overnight then into early Friday morning, right around about 2 a.m. There wind gusts 70, 75 miles per hour. Some isolated tornadoes still will be a possibility and any dirt roads that you do have around in your neighborhoods or you know just around your backyard, things like that. Um, certainly try to stay off those roads. One, some of them could get washed out and flooded, but two, we are again certainly expecting a lot of down trees, potentially some down power lines, uh, making th uh, certain back roads impassable there through some of those more rural areas in southeast Georgia. Now bring it back down south, St. John's, Flagler counties, worst of the storm between 11 a.m. and 11 p.m. there for you on Thursday. Similar story as Duval, wind gusts 50 to 60 miles per hour, few isolated tornadoes there. Clay and Putnam, really not a whole lot changing. 10 to 10. Isolated tornadoes, wind gusts 50 to 60. Uh, rainfall total is going to be again two to about four inches of rain, and really that's going to be the uh, expected totals for most areas along the I 95 corridor when you're talking about rainfall. And then our coastal southeast Georgia counties, the only area that might actually see a little bit of some storm surge with those onshore winds, you could see about a two to four foot storm surge for areas uh, in the Brunswick area all the way down to pretty much northern Fernandina Beach could see a little bit of some storm surge, but really the big story here is going to be the wind threat further west of us as the storm makes landfall. So if you can try to wrap it all up into one here, this is kind of what we're thinking, at least for the time being, as I had mentioned, the forecast is going to change. We're still well over two to three days away from this. This isn't going to make landfall until Thursday evening. So we're going to have to tweak this here or there a little bit, but for the time being, worst impacts are going to be further west out towards that I-75 corridor for Jacksonville. Strongest wind gusts will primarily be between about 40 and 60 miles per hour. Lake City will see the strongest and worst of those wind gusts, 80 mile per hour plus. That could be very damaging. Expect power outages in those areas. 
rainfall uh, totals two to if not four, nearly five inches of rain. The further west you go, the higher the rainfall totals will generally be besides a few localized areas that do get some of those stronger thunderstorms and downpours to roll on through. So street flooding will be a minor concern, but uh, we are not expecting tidal basin flooding. We're not expecting ocean waters to surge up the St. Johns River or anything like that and into those estuaries. So that is not a concern. The storm surge threat uh, is very minimum. As I'd mentioned, Brunswick and our southeast coastal Georgia counties are the only areas that might see a minimum uh, effect of storm surge. And other than that, we're really just kind of waiting for Helene to kind of get her act together, become a tropical storm likely overnight tonight and into tomorrow morning. And then eventually once she makes that turn north, it's going to make a beeline towards Florida's Gulf Coast. We'll have more on this coming up on First Coast News at 11 and over the next couple of days. But as I had mentioned at the beginning, I'm meteorologist Ross Mumal.